So I wanted to start with uh, the reason that I'm so excited about RISC-V. And the reason is that um, it enables a lot of people who otherwise probably wouldn't have decided to implement their own cores or taking an existing core and modifying it to create something new to be able to do that. And, and I think the reason for that is that it lowers the barriers to being able to do that. Um, so what I'm hoping to do is try and explain how it does that by talking a bit about the ISA and then the whole ecosystem that's sprung up around it. I'm mainly speaking from my point of view, my view of the world. I think there's other reasons that people get excited about RISC-V as well. Um, and there's lots of, lots of things you could talk about in RISC-V. Um, so in particular, some things that I'm not going to talk about are um, the history and heritage of RISC-V or the governance of it with the RISC-V Foundation. And I'm not going to get in too much technical depth, but do feel free to ask me questions about other stuff as well. Um, so um, just before I get started with all that, just a, a quick self-introduction. So I'm a compiler engineer at Embicosm. Uh, recently, I've been working on a tool chain for a customized RISC-V processor and also a project to help developers write secure software using techniques in compilers. So Embicosm is a compiler tool chain consultancy. We do a lot of work with GCC and LLVM. And we're members of the RISC-V Foundation. Um, so partly what I'm talking about is based on the experience we've gained at Embicosm working with RISC-V over the last few months. So um, what is RISC-V? And the answer to that is that it's a, a free and open instruction set architecture, or ISA. Now, you might be wondering, what is an ISA? What does it mean? And um, the definition I, or a description of it that I like is it's kind of the interface between computer hardware and computer software. It's a description of that interface. So um, if you have a piece of hardware that implements a particular ISA and a piece of software that's um, uh, compiled for that ISA, then you should be able to expect that piece of software to run on that piece of hardware. Now, that's kind of an abstract description, so to try and be more concrete, um, there's some examples of other ISAs that you might have heard of, the ARM ISA, Intel's x86 ISA, PowerPC, Spark. Um, so, in a sense, you may already have an idea of what an ISA is. Um, but what does, an, what does the documentation for an ISA actually specify? What does it tell you? And broadly, it... Um, consists of the things, the details that will be visible to an assembly language programmer, and a bit more information as well. So an ISA uh, description tells you things like what the registers are in the hardware, how, what width they are, what data types they take, how many of them there are, if they've got any special properties. Um, it also contain, will contain a list of all the instructions and all their semantics. And then uh, encodings of all those instructions. How do individual instructions get translated? into some like packed bits or words or bytes or whatever that the hardware can actually understand. So that's roughly what an ISA document specifies. Um, it doesn't specify everything. So the things that it doesn't specify in particular are, um, it doesn't specify how an implementation of uh, a core implement of that ISA should, should work. So that means that uh, you can have lots of different bits of hardware that all implement the same ISA. You can have a very simple core, like maybe in order, no pipelining, very small, um, that implements an ISA. Or you can have a, a very complicated uh, superscalar, pipeline, deeply pipelined core, or anything in between, all which implement the same ISA and can run the same programs for that ISA. Um, it also doesn't tell you... Um, what software you should write for that ISA, or how that, how that software should be built. So you can have a variety of different compilers targeting that ISA, and then if a compiler targets an ISA and you can build software for that ISA, um, then uh, you can have lots of different programs that will run on the hardware implemented in that ISA. So you could have a GCC implementation target an ISA, an LLVM implementation. If Microsoft has decided to implement one in Visual Studio as well, it could target any ISA. Um, so now we've got a bit of an idea about what an ISA is. Um, let's look at the RISC-V ISA in particular. Uh, so I don't want to go into too much detail about it, but just describe some of the properties of it. One of the things that I really like about it is it's actually quite uh, a boring ISA. Now, that's a, that sounds a bit of a funny thing to, to like, but it's actually a really good thing. You might expect that a relatively new ISA like RISC-V would have lots of advanced and interesting features, 
But in practice, having lots of advanced and interesting features makes it difficult for everyone, difficult for hardware implementers if they've got to implement lots of complicated things and features, difficult for compiler writers, uh, because if there's lots of different ways of doing things and lots of constraints on all the different features you have, it's more difficult to generate efficient code. Um, so the RISC-V visor is kind of a bit like MIPS. Um, I think it was originally started as uh, a modification of MIPS and then sort of grew into something else in its own right. But it's got lots, uh, or it doesn't have lots of the things that would make MIPS a bit more complicated. Um, because it's a RISC ISA, um, it's got a relatively simple, small set of instructions, and the register files are relatively uniform. They don't have too many um, different um, things going on with lots of different registers. Di don't have too many different things going on with registers. I do, uh, I will elaborate a bit more on that in a minute. So the ISA is designed to be targeted at a really wide range of systems as well, from the smallest, most deeply embedded systems all the way up to very large, multi-core, high-performance systems. And um, you might wonder, how can one ISA target such a wide range of systems? And the reason is that the ISA specification doesn't um, target a, uh, sorry, the ISA specification doesn't specify a single ISA. It's not one size fits all. Instead, it describes a set of base ISAs, which you can then extend with different instruction set extensions as you need or see fit. So the base ISAs, they're either 32-bit or 64-bit. Um, the 32-bit ISAs, um, E and I, are both quite similar, the difference between them being that E's only got 16 registers, and that's just designed for the very smallest of systems. Uh, the 64-bit uh, ISA is, is similar to the 32-bit ones, but extends the register width to 64 bits. One of the um, boring things about RISC-V that I like so much uh, that the instruction width for all these base sizes is just 32 bit. It's simple, there's no variable length instructions uh, in the base sizer. So that's something that makes it easier for the hardware implementer. It makes instruction decoding simpler. And it's easier for the compiler engineer because instruction scheduling is easier. Um, all of these base sizes give you an architecture that can do integer arithmetic only without even having multiply or divide operations. So they're quite basic. Because of that, um, there's various different extensions that can be added on top of that. So the standard set of extensions on the left, you can add multiply and divide for integers, uh, atomic operations, uh, and floating point units. Some of the more esoteric extensions on the right, the, the, uh, I think non-standard ones, include things like quad precision floating point, and decimal floating point, and bit manipulation, things like that. Lots of different things. So, because there's all these different base uh, ISAs and all these different extensions that you could add on top of them, you could have lots of different cores that all implement slightly different variants of the ISA. I think in a way that could um, lead to a little bit of unnecessary fragmentation of the ecosystem. So one thing that combats that a bit is that there is a, a standard sort of set of ISA extensions called G, which is shorthand for having integers with multiply, uh, atomic operations, and a floating point unit. So you would commonly expect probably a lot of targets to have uh, all of those um, standard extensions. Although it's worth noting that for, I think for a general purpose, say Linux-based system, you would expect it to target something like RV64, so the base architecture with the standard extensions, and then the C extension as well for compressed instructions. So I think a lot of Linux systems would probably end up targeting that. Um, OK, so that's, what the, um, that's sort of the way the eyes are structured. And I want to talk a little bit in, about the particular RISC-V ecosystem. So I'm going to highlight some things in the ecosystem that I found interesting or that have caught my attention for some reason or other. There are um, lots more things in the ecosystem as well that I haven't noticed or just haven't got time to talk about now. So this is just really a small subset. The idea being to show uh, how many things are going on with it, so how the ecosystem's growing and thriving. So in terms of hardware, um, over the last few months I've noticed at least 20 different implementations of cores implementing the ISA or system on chips based on cores that implement the ISA or chip generators. Some of the ones that I think are quite interesting in particular are um, the RISCI uh, core from the Pulp platform, uh, Clifford Wolf's Pico RV32, uh, the rocket chip generator from Barclay, uh, Sci-5's um, 
freedom system on a chip, the low risk system on a chip. Now, as I say, there are lots of other cores as well. It's not to say that all those aren't interesting as well, but they're just interesting for probably different reasons that interest me. On the software side, uh, there's a, a port of all the GNU uh, development tools to RISC-V. The GCC and BIN utils ports are now upstream, and the process of upstreaming, the other parts of that tool chain are in progress as well. There's also a port of LLVM, which at the minute is work in progress, but it seems to be shaping up quite nicely. In terms of operating systems, there's at least a Linux and a FreeBSD port. I noticed there's a port of FreeRTOS, which is a, a real-time operating system. Um, and also that the uh, Fedora Linux distribution has been bootstrapped on RISC-V. So um, there's a version of the Fedora distribution with all the packages and everything for RISC-V. As well as things that are purely hardware and software, there's things that I kind of see as being on the boundary of software and hardware. Um, so sort of simulators and emulators, that kind of thing. So um, there's the Spy Kaiser simulator, which is kind of the golden reference uh, implementation of the ISA, which you can use to compare against if you're testing your own ISA. Um, there's a port of QEMU for RISC-V as well. Um, so you can use that to run um, uh, a RISC-V system, say, on top of your Linux desktop. Um, there's also a project called RV8, which is seems to be quite an interesting looking RISC-V to x86 uh, binary translation system. It looks like quite a cool project, but I haven't had time to uh, play around with that yet, but it looks like a really nice piece of work. So I'm just going to talk in a little bit more detail about some of those cores in particular, because I think they're interesting starting points, hopefully of interest to... Um, hopefully of interest. So first of all, uh, Clifford Wolf's Pico RV32 core. Um, I wanted to draw attention to this because I think it's a really great starting point if you want to get um, into sort of understanding how the implementation of a CPU works because it's ever such a small and simple implementation in a few hundred lines of Verilog. Even someone like me who's not really a hardware person, I just kind of have a shaky grasp of Verilog at best. Um, I can sort of read it and get an idea of what's going on and like make small modifications to it. So it's a really good, it's a really good thing to start with for tinkering. Um, it's been designed in particular with being able to um, put on an FPGA with a very high clock rate, so it goes up to several hundred megahertz on various different FPGAs. Um, the trade-off with it in uh, some sense is that it's a little bit slow in terms of cycles per instruction. So in some benchmarking that I'd done uh, with some small embedded benchmarks, uh, the Beebs benchmark suite, um, when I measured it, it seemed like it was taking about four cycles to execute an instruction on average. Uh, the next core that I um, find quite interesting is the Risky core from the Pulp platform. So it's a little bit more complicated than the um, Pico RV32. It implements a four-stage in-order pipeline. Um, so because of that, um, it's, it's a bit faster in terms of cycles per instruction than Pico RV32. Again, when I did benchmarking, it seemed to manage to do about one instruction per cycle. So for, for a back-of-the-envelope calculation, um, it's about four times faster per megahertz um, than Pico RV32. Now, as I keep iterating, I'm not a hardware person, so if that's a really stupid uh, calculation to do, please shout at me. Um, because it's a bit more complex than Pico RV32 and it's got this pipelining, the implementation source itself is a little bit more complex. It's a, bit, it's a little bit more than I can sort of get my head around with a limited experience of Verilog. But if you're kind of familiar with hardware design, I imagine you'll still find it quite straightforward. Also, looking at the source code, it is so immaculately designed and laid out. It's really, you know, uh, um, really nice to look at, a really beautiful project. Um, There's also the uh, rocket chip generator from Barclay, uh, and that's something that's much more complicated than either of those, other, those two other cores. So you can use it to generate various RV32 and 64 cores with different extensions, as well as a whole system on the chip with uh, different cores on them, uh, a network and peripherals and all sorts of stuff on it. Um, the implementation of the rocket chip generator is done in uh, Scala and a language called Chisel, which is a domain-specific language for designing hardware in Scala. So that tool chain itself um, allows you to generate 
implementations, either using for Verilator to produce a cycle accurate model, or you can target FPGAs, or you can target BLSI tools as well. Um, as I mentioned, it's very complex. It's not something that I've been able to get to grips with myself. Um, but if you're more familiar with hardware or Scala or those kinds of things, um, it might be quite interesting to look at. One thing that I do think is quite um, interesting about it is that it has been used to generate various chips that have been taped out for research purposes at Barclay over the past few years. Um, one other thing I wanted to talk about is some actual RISC-V hardware that you can buy now, which is Sci-Fi's Freedom E310 system on a chip. And that comes on their Hi-5 one board, which is a board with an Arduino form factor with that RISC-V chip on it. Um, so as well as fit, being able to fit an Arduino shield to, to it, you can also uh, program it using the Arduino IDE. I think it's a really great starting point. If your interest is not so much in hardware, but doing software development uh, for RISC-V, then you can just buy one of these, use the RISC-V tool chain with it, and get developing. Um, it's relatively inexpensive. I think you can buy it for $59 on crowd supply. Um, okay, so um, that was sort of a very little introduction to a few bits of the ecosystem that I've kind of noticed. Um, the why, why, is, um, why, is it, why is such a great ecosystem sprung up around RISC-V? I think, the re or at least to me, it looks like the reason for that is, that there's, is the free and open nature of the ISA. It kind of reduces the amount of risk you have and the initial investment you have to make to start developing hardware or software with it. So for example, you don't need to buy a license for the architecture if you want to uh, implement a core. You don't need to license hardware designs from anyone if you don't want to, because there's lots of open source cores that are probably a good starting point. And that's not to say that there won't be closed source designs and designs that you can license as well, but um, there's sort of a, a lot of choice there. Um, there's also no charge for documentation on the ISA. Um, if you do start developing something and then you think, okay, I want to develop uh, or sell a commercial end user product, call it, calling it RISC V, then you do need to make sure that your implementation conforms to the ISA using the ISA test suite, and you do need to join the RISC V Foundation. But I imagine that's quite a lower bar than, say, selling a commercial product for a different ISA. Um, so lots of good things about the ecosystem. There are a few challenges as well that I've noticed over the past few months that I just wanted to draw attention to. Um, so although I, the documentation is free, some of it can be a bit limited. So here's an excerpt from the RISC V assembly programmer's handbook. I don't know if you can read the small text there, but it says, this chapter is a placeholder for an assembly programmer's manual. So, so uh, that'll be coming soon. What that means in practice is that you tend to have to hunt around various different GitHub repositories uh, to find a bit of documentation, or sometimes I just can't find what I'm looking for, do some experiments with the compiler tool chain instead to see what it does, see what code it generates to get uh, an idea about whatever it was that I was trying to find out. Um, the uh, second thing that I found to be a bit of a challenge over the last few months is when things are going upstream. Um, uh, so some parts of the software ecosystem are being upstream now, in particular, uh, Linux, Newlib, and GDB. So that means as, before the upstreaming process is complete, they might be subject to change. So you do need to keep an eye uh, on changes to those things that might be incompatible or breaking changes um, that you find from a, a system you were using from an earlier revision. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's not a huge problem, but something you need to keep track of. Um, also, the ISA test suite that I mentioned that you need to conform to is, is a little bit basic. So, if you implement a core and it passes the ISA test suite, it's, in theory, it should be able to run programs that are um, for RISC V, but in practice, it still leaves room for lots of different implementation errors, mistakes you could make. Um, so what we've used to um, kind of get around that issue for now is the GCC regression test suite, because that contains about 87,000 tests, lots of which um, are executed on the target. But the idea of it, of it being is that um, to check that GCC's generated the correct code, but it, it al it's also sort of implicitly checking that the um, core is executing the generated code correctly. So if you get some failures in the GCC regression test suite, it can pinpoint things that might not be right that need fixing. Um, the long-term solution for this, I believe, is that the 
there is a testing working group that's been uh, appointed by the Risk Five Foundation that are working on improving the ISA test suite. Um, so, um, but th th those, those three things are the main kind of issues that I've come across over the past few months. Um, for the future, what's going to happen to the ecosystem? I think that those issues that I've talked about will just go away. As things get upstream, they'll stabilize, the documentation will get better, all the implementations that we have, the bugs will get teased out, of them if the, yeah, and they'll sort of come to be seen as more dependable and more reliable. Um, I've decided to take a, take a risk of making a prediction of where I think we'll see risk 5 in the future. I think in the, sh in the short term, we'll see it in lots of embedded systems, places where there's maybe some other small embedded core already, um, in things where what the processor is or exactly what it's doing aren't really the concern of the person using it. So in things like all sorts of peripherals like GPUs and hard disks and network hardware and things like that. And then I think in the more medium term, we're likely to see um, it moving into general purpose computing devices. Like I imagine you might see lots of single sm uh, uh, sorry, small board computers with RISC-V with RISC processors. Uh, I think the kind of thing that would maybe be used in a phone as well. I kind of like the idea that maybe in a few years' time I'd be able to buy a RISC-V based phone. Uh, in the longer term, um, maybe we'd see it moving into bigger systems, like more um, servers, that kind of thing. Um, I think the uh, system builders and the customers for those kinds of products are probably a bit more conservative than the other two um, groups, so that's something that would probably take quite a bit longer. But it does seem like there's various uh, system builders that are kind of interested in doing that, so we might see something like that. I, I don't want to make too strong a prediction about what I think is going to happen there. So, um, your laptop is screensaver. Seven or eight minutes. Okay. Anyway, this is to conclude. Um, if you're now really excited about RISC V and want to get started with it, where do you start? Uh, what the best starting point is depends on exactly what you want to do. So if you um, just want to do some work with software, uh, you just want to use your desktop PC, Linux PC, using an instruction set simulator, then the official RISC V tool chain is a good starting point. Um, there's a readme in the repository that walks you through building all the tool chain and the ISA simulator in not too many steps. So um, with a little bit of work, you can get to a point where you can build and run RISC-V programs. If you want to buy the Hi5 hardware instead and use that for development because you don't want to faff about the simulator or you're inter more interested in running on actual hardware, then um, I would use the uh, Sci-Fi Freedom ESDK instead, which is a, um, just a slightly modified version of the RISC-V toolchain that's a bit more specialized for that particular hardware, and it comes with some examples as well. You can use the official RISC-V toolchain to build stuff for it as well, but it won't come with examples, and you'll have to faff about with linker scripts and things. Um, if you're interested in cycle-accurate modeling, uh, then um, at Embicosm, we've produced a couple of very later models of RISC-E and Pico RV32 um, that are on our GitHub. Um, there are more details that I want to provide for that, so I'm giving a talk about uh, cycle accurate modeling of risk five at Orconf next weekend. I was hoping to release a repository of scripts and tools to build and use those fairly, um, fairly easily um, along with that talk, but I haven't quite got around to doing that yet. Um, if you fancy doing something a bit more advanced or scaring yourself using the rocket chip generator, um, then the rocket chip repository has got a readme in it that walks you through building all that tool chain and getting started with it. Um, so, um, those are the different places that I would get started uh, experimenting with Risk Five. Um, that's all for now. Um, are there any questions? Thank you.